As you know, the, uh, you all know by now Sandy Hilal, and she will be our chair for this last session. And this last session will uh, title is Claims of Subjugated Heritage. It's a round table discussion, so more of what Sandy and Elizandro say, a continuation of a conversation. So, and we will have questions and answer after the they all present. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, it will be all about us uh, sitting together and elaborating what we heard in the morning and how we can continue uh, this, this discussion. And therefore, we thought about it as, and we decided also to push this a bit so we are not disconnected from uh, you. And, and we are hoping that this would create a sort of a more discussion rather than us presenting, because basically we are not fully presenting, we are taking uh, 10 minutes uh, each eventually to just put on the table uh, certain things in order to be discussed. And actually, we thought that we will uh, begin with um, Zaki. Uh, and, and Zaki would be sort of almost, uh, you know, what we asked him uh, as, a, as a hard uh, uh, thing to do is he just arrived and, and uh, he had no chance to see whatever happened, but only the idea of a camp being ins inscribed as, as uh, a heritage site from his uh, position as somebody coming uh, uh, from UNESCO. I, we would like him just to jump in the table and tell us what are the first impressions that he might ever have. And, and he was struggling telling me, but tell me more what happened this morning. And I said, you don't need to know more what happened this morning. He said, all what we need from you is to uh, interact because sometimes fresh uh, thoughts are much better than the ones that are already, that have been elaborated already for hours. So we are, really hoping in your generosity of fresh thoughts uh, and asking you maybe too much to hand No, it. not at all. Thank you, Cindy. And thank you for inviting me to this uh, round table and conference. I'm so happy to be with you. Uh, I'm not sure how fresh my ideas will be, but uh, I'm trying to to really uh, give you my first impressions. Uh, I'm sorry I missed the morning session, which uh, apparently it was a very rich uh, discussion. I spoke also to Jad Tabet, who gave me some ideas about what you discussed in the areas where I come from, actually. Um, I, uh, I don't know how many of you know, know ECROM. Um, ECROM is uh, an intergovernmental institution established by UNESCO, and we are advisory body to the World Heritage C uh, Committee. Um, ECROM is also... Um, uh, a partner with UNESCO in many, many areas, uh, including the intangible heritage, uh, uh, underwater cultural heritage, uh, and many other types of heritage, not only the World Heritage Sites per se. But we are particularly an advisory body to the, to the committee, and we're here where my, perhaps my input and, uh, would come perhaps into the context of this um, exhibition and the uh, fabulous, actually, uh, work that was presented to us uh, just before this session um, about the uh, refugee heritage in the Dehesha camp. Um, I, I wanted just to highlight, to, to highlight a few issues. I mean, I mean we as an institution also uh, try to uh, provide a kind of a, a platform for discussions such as these ones, to discuss issues similar to these. In fact, uh, coincidentally, we had uh, a few weeks ago uh, an Arab forum on cultural heritage that some of you here attended, uh, and we discussed issues uh, that apparently you discussed this morning, issues of colonization the effect on cultural heritage, particularly on the region, in this particular uh, region, and, and how we perceive heritage even as communities, professionals, or individuals. And um, I think in that sense, I think it is uh, really important to reflect on basic questions we addressed during that forum about the what. What is the heritage we're talking about? Uh, heritage is not only world heritage. There are different types of heritage. We're talking today about refugee heritage. So it is actually one area that uh, interests us much um, 
uh, nowadays with the destruction of heritage that is taking place in many other places around Palestine as well, like in Syria, Iraq, and, and Libya and Yemen. So we have been trying to look into these issues um, in, 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 in many, from different angles, let's say. And um, we tried also to, to really understand if we understand what is the nature of each type of heritage or the heritage we talk about, in this case, the Dehesha camp, and we saw the beautiful pictures to, taken by Luca, the professional photographer, the beautiful uh, pictures that we had and the images at, at, uh, at the gallery. Um, it is always a perception. I mean, uh, Luca, I think, coming from Italy, would look at, and as, as he did also images of world heritage, he, took, uh, he talked about mo monumentalization, for example. He looked at the, um, at the very architecture, perhaps, of, of this camp. Uh, and I asked him, did you take any pictures of the communities, for example? We could see only architecture, and, uh, and these pictures were taken at night. So that gives uh, an impression that we are here looking, because of your work on the World Heritage File, all the issues related to the aesthetic values, as we call them, uh, are really uh, at, it, at the background of whatever you were trying to do. But at the same time, I think even if we look at the UNESCO level at diff different conventions, and I'm sure you discussed this this morning, we could look at the very also other issues related to the intangible heritage and issues related to communities and people um, that might not manifest uh, sometimes in beautiful uh, architectural uh, products, for example, or, or uh, but they are still expressions. And, and, and Luca, I think was, I can't remember who was explaining that the light in one of the rooms really express how people live inside uh, this, this house and gives an impression by having this image would, Im would give you an impression about the people. Um, so what I think the first impression that I have here is that I think it's good to have this provoca provocation to look into world heritage as a site, as a physical entity of a place, because world heritage is about sites, about tangible aspects, about, uh, you know, you cannot talk about world heritage without uh, making limits of a certain area. Uh, Jad suggested, I guess, to have a serial uh, perhaps um, idea of adding the villages nearby with the communities living. So here we're talking about the physical more. I mean, if you allow me, it's a bit, it's much more than the other um, attributes that usually we call when we define the values of any place. Um, there are different other values that were, could be highlighted also through the images, the life, the spirit, the, uh, the feeling, the communities living and their story and the narratives that we saw also in the calligraphy um, illustration that we had. So I think we could look beyond all these issues. While in the World Heritage there is one criterion talking about the intangibles, criterion number six, but still I think uh, if we are looking about World Heritage and, ex and in fact what they call in the intangible um, World Heritage Convention issues related to, um, to expressions, to cultural expressions, and I think that is much more perhaps would be much more, uh, how to say, um, uh, you know, would, would, would receive much more attention, I believe, if you really want to uh, go through uh, this route. Um, the intangible aspects are very uh, visible. You could look at uh, different other uh, areas where, you know, refugees, uh, refugee camps, or even immigration of people happened. And now we talk a lot about what we call the people-centered approaches even in the way we do uh, protection of heritage and expression of art and expression of, of in architecture, but these, the, 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 um, the basic element in all this is, is the human being and the, 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 the intellectual even thinking about how the expressions have been uh, defined. So maybe this could be one way 
looking at the images that Luca took for this exhibition if we think about the World Heritage uh, context. So I think this was my first impression um, because we very much, especially people working in art and architecture, and I'm an architect, by the way, so, <laughs> so I can see the value of looking at this, but I think we can look beyond and behind all these aspects uh, in a new uh, reflection with a new perception, uh, especially about the lives of people more than the, the art or the architecture in that case, uh, per se. Um, so I think uh, this is what I wanted to, to, to really highlight. Um, we can think about attributes all the time. I, I repeat, this could be related to um, the feeling at a place, the spirit of a place, the functions that exist in a place when you see images of, of you know, the shops, like the, 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 the rooms, the streets, and even the calligraphy, which could form you know, part of the expression of, of, of the, refugee, the refugees in these camps. So, so I think with this, maybe we could look with a new, uh, how to say, um, uh, in a new way, perhaps, of looking at, at such, uh, uh, you know, uh, significance. And I, I want to use the word actually significance because when we talk about world heritage, we talk about outstanding universal values and the meanings that are actually transmitted through through this. So in fact, these, this significance and the meaning that is held by what we define and within which attributes is what we want to uh, bring to the fore and, and convey as a message uh, to the world in, in the case of World Heritage. So these are my first impressions. I hope I succeeded in giving you my first impression without uh, being part of the first uh, pan of the, the first session here, um, and I'm sure there will yeah. be many questions related to this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Zeki, and, and maybe now, uh, you know, fr from there and from what heritage might mean, we will take you in a complete other journey, and, and you know, uh, we have now a Palestinian museum, and, and certainly we are faced with the whole question of what heritage is in a Palestinian museum. And we are giving Zena again the hard task of explaining, you know, how uh, other ways of, of tackling uh, heritage might be. So I don't know, we, we would like to hear from you, you know, how, yeah, where you. are we going? Yeah. yeah. Right, when uh, Salwa asked me to present here uh, this afternoon, she asked a specific question. She said, how are you at the Palestinian Museum engaging with refugee heritage and what are your plans with this regards? So I have prepared this uh, short presentation. I will start with this little video. <laughs> أنا مرتبط فيه أو صار في ارتباط بين بينه هو دام من من مخيم ولكن قبل باب إذا شافوا أي حدا حتى في مخيم ليهم في سوريا راح يعرف إنه هو مخيم على باب بيت وكالة لو شافوا حدا من مخيم عين الحيد والإمام راح يعرف إنه هو من طرف الوكالة بس هذا الباب بالذات هو كان أول باب استخدموه اللاجئين الفلسطينيين من بعد ما تفجروا قراهم إلى المخيمات ولون كمان الأزرق اللي كمان دعمينا الشيء كثير إنه اللون الأزرق هو عالم الوكالة الغوت عالم الأمم المتحدة هو السيارة اللي كانت جبنا التمويل والأكل هي السيارة اللي كانت توزع علينا أواعي في المخيم والمدرسة اللي أنا درست فيها طول عمري من أهم الحواجز اللي لازم تخترقها عشان تطلع تلعب في الشارع يعني أول حاجز هو الباب أول شيء تتمرد عليه في حياتك هو أن تتمرد على هذا الباب فيش حدا عندنا في المخيم عنده باب أكبر من الباب اللي معك وفيش حدا عنده أصغر منه فكان في نوع ما يكون يعني مساواة بين الناس حاليا صار في فروقات كثيرة في دول كبيرة وفي دول صغيرة وفي في طبقية يعني كل شيء دول المخيم تغير إلا المخيم
So uh, this is what the camps looked like. I guess these are the shelters that Alexandra referred to. And this is what uh, Mohanad Laaz's uh, childhood would have, would have looked like with, with all the doors uh, similar, equal, and uh, all uh, uh, blue doors. Um, now we are going to move to a completely different uh, space, completely different place. And uh, it is in striking contrast to what we have seen this morning, all the quaint uh, photos that Luca took. And also, I, I mean, to be honest, uh, I feel a bit um, anxious showing all these <laughs> glamorous uh, images after the, the, the presentations we had in the morning and after the talks we had in the morning. Uh, so the questions, is this legitimate or not? Uh, do we deserve, as Palestinians, this kind of institution where maybe under this roof there we will be a space where we will uh, decolonize minds? Can we do it? Um, anyway, so this is the Palestinian Museum. Um, the interview we have just seen is a quintessential expression of the paradox lived by Palestinian refugees, which this conference attempts to highlight. A door to a home signifies a place of permanence, and in the context of refugee camp, it becomes an exercise in contradiction. This is one aspect of the experience of Palestinian refugees, which the Palestinian Museum attempts to reflect. It forms part of a larger Palestinian narrative, which is under constant threat of erasure. One of the museum's most important goals is to combat that threat by constantly promoting, unearthing, and revitalizing that narrative. Uh, the Palestinian Museum is an independent institution dedicated to supporting an open and dynamic Palestinian culture nationally and internationally. The museum presents and engages with new perspectives on Palestinian history, society, and culture, particularly in the period from 1750 onwards. It also offers spaces for creative ventures, educational programs, and innovative research. The museum is a flag flagship project of Assisted Ta'awun Welfare Association and one of the most exciting new cultural projects in Palestine today. Is the Palestinian Museum a national museum? The Palestinian Museum does not promote an official line or a particular political agenda, though the issues with which it deals with are undoubtedly political. The Yasser Arafat Museum and the Mahmoud Darwish Museum, for instance, can be considered semi-official institutions, adhering to a particular discourse, one which claims to represent a definitive account of the Palestinian struggle. We see any such claim to authoritativeness as problematic at best. How, after all, can one have a national museum before achieving national liberation? More broadly, what does it mean to be a museum under colonialism? To be sure, Museums in the West have historically been implicated to varying degrees in colonial history, but museums are changing and are breaking out of their colonial mold. They are not merely confined to promoting an official narrative, but to creating their own narratives, which are drawn from the experiences of people. In a sense, museums in the context of exile populations must adapt to these circumstances and represent the people whose culture it celebrates. This is what the museum has been compelled to do, to adapt its activities around the context of its people. The most important part of that context is that Palestinians, a people comprised primarily of refugees, are separated by geography. Dispersed across the entire world, they lack a body which recognizes their unity, even amidst fragmentation. This is why the Palestinian Museum must be for all Palestinians and not only those confined 
within tendentiously defined national borders. To that end, we address refugee heritage not in a single discrete exhibition or project, but rather weave it into all our activities. And our adaptation to the reality of geographic dispersal is reflected in a variety of mediums through which we promote refugee heritage. To be sure, our flag flagship projects, our exhibitions, are held in the physical space of the museum in Birzeit, where we also implement our public and educational programs, all of which cater to the Palestinian public in the West Bank. But we also have joint and traveling exhibitions which have toured places as varied as Beirut and Geneva. And very crucially, we have exploited digital space to, to move beyond the borders which separate Palestinian people. Two ambitious online projects of the Palestinian Museum are now underway in parallel a digital archive, and a platform called Palestinian Journeys. The digital archive aims to find, preserve, and share documents, photos, texts, and objects which are under constant threat of destruction, loss, or confiscation. It should be obvious to anyone familiar with Palestinian history why this is an important project at a time when such documents have been systematically stolen only to reappear in Zionist archives out of reach. Many of these documents have belonged to refugees. In a similar way, Palestinian Journeys is an online portal into the multiple facets of the Palestinian experience. The, the platform is filled with fact-based historical accounts, biographies, events, and undiscovered stories. Together, they seek to craft an ever-growing comprehensive narrative which highlights the active role of the Palestinian people in crafting their own history. It is divided into two sections, a comprehensive timeline of Palestinian history and the stories which present marginalized and unknown experiences. The museum has also documented oral history interviews as part of its project, Never Part, from which the interview at the beginning of this presentation was taken. We have featured artworks by Palestinian refugees in our inaugural exhibition, Jerusalem Lives. Sadly, and due to Israeli restrictions, not all of the artworks that were sent to us from exile were able to reach us. In October, we will be hosting a traveling exhibition, Past Disquiet, which is making its way to us from Barcelona, Berlin, Paris, Beirut, and Santiago. This exhibition highlights international solidarity with the Palestine liberation struggle during the 1970s. And in our upcoming exhibition, Labor of Love, or Ghazl al uruq we are featuring Palestinian embroidery, celebrating refugee heritage, and telling the stories of refugee women through the lenses of gender, labor, commodity, and class. But the museum, but what is important here is not only that mu the museum alters its content, addressing the topic of refugee heritage, or including the works of Palestinian refugees, from across the world, but that it, ha it also alters its form by traveling the world and taking advantage of digital space so that it could be a museum for all Palestinians. This is what it means to be a museum for an exiled population and a museum under colonialism. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Zina, to uh, bring us into this and maybe to bring uh, such important question of what does it mean today uh, actually to have institution under colonialism because it's uh, part of 
all the struggle, I, I, I believe that there are two things that people under colonialism are denied of. One is the public space and, and means one is uh, uh, the fact that we are a collectivity and, and in that sense to question what collectivity is because it's very important also as a role of an institution to understand today Palestine and what, what uh, constitute a collectivity in Palestine. And the second thing that colonized people are denied of is their heritage and is their uh, actually ability to write their own story and in which way this story would be written. And I think that this would be uh, absolutely a big challenge for the, uh, uh, for the museum. And you know, I want to bring you back because we are sitting with three people that actually was part of what I consider was our collectivity in the struggle of decolonization. And, and they are the three sitting on the table. And in that sense, you know, I would, would like to tell how we tackled decolonization because it's not an issue if it is possible to have a museum under colonialism rather than is it a celebration of a state that would never arrive or maybe this would not be the whole thing is that what are Palestinian doing are they celebrating institutions that they have maybe denied of but but then to which purposes and what is exactly that we are celebrating or is these institutions uh, might be that place where we can still be using them in order to activate processes of decolonization, not only among us, but internationally, right? So, I mean, and I would like to bring you back uh, to how ourselves, how we establish DAR, and how we attract people to come and be part of this struggle together with us. And, and maybe we then can understand how this can be applied to other institutions or maybe in other forms. And in that sense, it is where I would like to bring the three of you, because you were a part of the residency into, and, and of course, part of a decolonization struggle in many ways. So, and, and uh, you know, when we establish, when we arrived to live in Beit Sahur, uh, I mean, we came after many years living in, uh, in Italy. I myself was away for 13 years, and Alessandro was basically a foreigner. So what I, I mean, I come back to Beit Sahur with a foreigner husband, and, <laughs> and not knowing exactly how should I come back. And of course, we were faced with the fact that we were not belonging to the discourse in Palestine. I mean, and in, uh, I still remember when we went back, especially to Ramallah, when we were commissioned the project of stateless nation, and, and we were faced of who are you to be entitled to do the first big project of Palestine in Venice Biennale. And actually, we had eight years after sort of a very nice discussion among artists, and they say that they are, they told us that they are still angry out of the fact that it was not us that should have been done that work in Venice Biennale, right? So th there is a sort of very territorial entitlement, who has the right to the art, who has the right to the culture, and then slowly, slowly, we come back to Beit Sahur, and after many years of living in Beit Sahur, they accepted us as part of the Palestinian uh, art scene eventually, but it was better if we were in Ramallah, right? So t t we, we break a lot of taboos by deciding to be in Beit Sahur, but then, you know, we, we arrived there and we thought, how can we belong? No? And what does it mean for us actually to arrive to a place and begin to work there? And we established Dar at the beginning. It was me, uh, Alessandro, and Ian. Very, very strange combination no? in, in many ways. So they, first of all, I was uh, uh, quite relieved as a Palestinian not only to be put into this angle of being the Palestinian artist. So it, it I mean, how can they figure me out with uh, an Italian architect and Israeli architect, right? And maybe the three of us came to colonialism in, from a complete different directions, no? And from my side, I was coming out very much as somebody that, you know, I lived under colonialism and I wanted to understand who I am and how can I deal with this. Iyal is obviously on the other side and he wanted to understand of his vist as a colonizer in many ways, even if it was imposed on him and he wanted still to understand how he can decolonize himself. 
And maybe Alessandro coming out of a heritage of colonialism. I mean, Italians had a very interesting history of colonialism. And in many ways, it was an, a way also, another way of decolonizing the self, right? And this combination of the three coming from three different uh, ways of looking uh, colonization certainly helped a lot. Uh, you know, breaking certain taboos. And I would never forget when we were sitting, the three of us, and Alessandro was pushing for this idea of decolonizing the right of return. And me and Ial were freaking out, saying, you know, you cannot touch the right of return. What do you want? No, in, in many ways. And we needed somebody from outside to push us there to say, you know, it's guys, you are, I mean, all, in, in that sense, there was this, I see you, I see how much you have a colonial way of looking at the right of return, and you are unable to, uh, you know, figure it out, right? And in that sense, I felt all the time that I would have not done it alone. I don't know how to say, we needed many ways, many angles of looking at colonization in order to be able to have the power culturally, emotionally, spiritually to say, yes, we are many people coming together convinced that we can actually do something in the world. And, you know, as Palestinians, and here and maybe also a bit returning back to the Palestinian Museum, as Palestinians, if we would look at the last 15 years and how we inspired so many young generations from all over the world that felt the injustice of that world and felt that Palestine is the place from where to actually struggle against this, to, to, to do something against this injustice that they live everywhere in Europe and in, in many places. So, and in that sense, we ended up by opening our house as a way to say, let's all understand this together. No? And we had a lot of architects, artists, curators. I mean, many of them came as a matter of say, you know, maybe Palestine is the place from where I can understand many things. And for Palestinians, this is amazing because what really uh, happened is that this brought the Palestinian struggle not only within a territorial struggle, but rather than a, a, a bigger one and through which we can uh, actually speak about decolonization in terms of uh, larger condition rather than only the one of Palestine. And, and maybe here, you know, I would like to bring it back to, th to three of the people with whom we worked and, and were part of the experience of Dar. Many of them came, I mean, Francesca came several times, uh, Nick came one time, and, and it was three very intensive months that I would like to, uh, you to, to, to discuss with us. And then maybe Luca to uh, tell us how he was almost, uh, you know, uh, grabbed into the whole thing. He even didn't, I mean, we, we just bring him to Palestine and put him there and ask him to do uh, that, that work. So in, in many ways, you know, maybe I would like to pass to them and, and um, you know, then to open the floor. Maybe, I don't know. Um, sure, I could. Um, it's so I, the first time I went to Palestine, I think it was even before Dar uh, started, was like 14, 15 years ago. So it was even before the institution uh, took place. And what is amazing uh, now is to think of uh, also the language that we are using today. Um, I mean, from yesterday, Think, uh, talking about the colonizing the mind seems the most common thing to talk about. If we think of 15 years ago, this wasn't even an idea. And now, obviously, we need to think of ways of emancipating ourselves. And so uh, what is very fascinating is to think that um, what seemed, un seemed unthinkable now has become part of our ordinary language. And so is the definition of refugee heritage. What is it? I mean, how is it that we talk about it with such an ease when it's not even a thing? So uh, I guess my thoughts uh, now are more, I mean, I play a role that I've played over the years uh, quite uh, with some ease, that is the, 
the devil's advocate. And so I'd rather ask questions than um, you know, draw conclusions of every sort. So, I mean, the first is how do we get so easily acquainted with a language that uh, does not quite exist? And how do we all of a sudden agree on certain meanings? And so now we're all, apparently we're all on the same platform, but are we really? So that is one thing. The other thing that um, I find quite interesting is, um, so I remember being in Beit Sahur when there was one of the first, like early, early discussions on this idea of heritage. And it was uh, thinking of Daisha as a place and how can it be presented to the public. So I remember this long discussion on whether there should be labels like in a museum that could um, identify places of uh, significance and value. And, and so I remember uh, being a little taken aback from that discussion and uh, how I think at that point there was this whole questioning of whether an operation of that kind would then uh, objectify uh, and hence uh, deprive of the profound political meanings objects or places of political significance. What, what do we do if we put a label on the bridge? Uh, what, what does that bridge become? Does it become a, a tourist attraction? Will it lose its political meaning? Will it lose the, the, the strength of the, the, the political struggle? And so I think that is, I mean, years have passed and answers have been kind of given, but I think some of those questions are, are still there. Uh, what are the implications of talking about uh, refugee heritage? What, what does it mean to bring heritage to, in, or uh, refugee heritage to institutional platforms where people have no connection with those things? Yes, indeed, we bring uh, awareness, but then what else? What are the risks of exoticizing? What are the risks of beautifying things that are certainly aesthetically interesting, but are we normalizing? Uh, are, and are we then playing the same game that we're fighting? So uh, I think what has been super interesting in these 15 years is being part of this unresolved conversation, because I mean, the beauty of all this is that the questions are ongoing, and these are not problems that have been solved. But uh, as I started with, I mean, it's amazing to see how certain kind of words that were unthinkable now have become part of the conversation. And so I think what is, what will be a very interesting to see is how far we will go with that and what all this will become. Um, so I think I'll leave it there and then. Um, yeah, uh, maybe I would move to, uh, Two or questions you need to translate to uh, Luca now and to, uh, and in that sense, you know, Luca is. Uh, we asked Luca, as as we mentioned before, to come and do uh, some of these photos in in Dehesha. and in that sense, uh, you know, he came first and he did it in Dehesha and then he went, he, we asked him another time to go and make the photos of the villages. And when I saw Luca yesterday, I asked him, how was it? Because we were not even in Palestine the second time he arrived. And even though, I mean, we would not have even the possibility to be with him because we cannot, I, I cannot access, uh, I don't have a permission to go to the uh, villages of refugees. And in that sense, he, he told me, you know, it was really a very painful work that you gave me and I was so relieved that you was not with me because this is well, this was the last thing that I wanted to have you no know, as a photographer so I I would like to ask him more why why he felt this was a painful uh, trajectory and and what really happened molto difficile in quanto ho visto 46 eh, paesi distrutti eh, in quanto le, le macerie sono sempre presenti quindi questo eh, è stato molto difficile 
uh, it was difficult in as much as he saw 46 villages that were destroyed and witnessing the existence of rubbles and uh, debris is always very painful. Nello stesso tempo ho cercato di lavorare non tanto su quello che era rimasto, no? sul residuo, eh, anche per questioni di, eh, di costruzione di un lavoro mh, che mi ero prefissato diverso, ma su quello che sta intorno a questi, eh, a questi residui. So he decided that rather than concentrated on what was left on the, the the, the rubbles, he wanted to focus on what was around uh, the, this, what he called residues. Non sapevo assolutamente prima di fare questa esperienza che cosa avrei trovato. Infatti ho pensato a come, a che atteggiamento prendere, a che atteggiamento assumere rispetto a dei luoghi che non conoscevo prima di quindi atteggiamento fotografico intendo. Uh, the, when he arrived he had no idea what he would find and so he uh, he decided to have an open attitude to, to respond to, to what uh, he would find uh, there because he was uh, reaching a new place. Un atteggiamento che insomma, la, la giusta distanza tra una documentazione eh, in quanto mi interessava molto eh, il numero, la lista, la vertigine eh, che, che nasce da, da questo numero 45, 46, no? E nello stesso tempo anche un, uh, un certo livello di interpretazione dei luoghi. He used a two-folded attitude, one that was strictly connected to documentation and that was connected to what he calls the vertical of the number. So 45 villages, and so documenting the evidence coming from all those 45 villages. And a second, it's an inter interpretation of the places that he saw. Per quanto riguarda quello che ho trovato, eh, diciamo, intorno a questi eh, luoghi residui, no? di, di, di macerie, eh, ho trovato parchi giochi eh, di, di tanti tipi, dove andare in jeep, dove correre, dove fare trekking, ho trovato insediamenti industriali, ho trovato kibbutz, quindi eh, o ex kibbutz, quindi villaggi eh, residenziali o, o parchi industriali. What he found around those uh, rubbles are very different things, like industrial parks and what he calls playgrounds of various sorts from playgrounds themselves to places where you can go trekking, uh, you can go around in a, in a jeep, or also uh, still inhabited or abandoned uh, kibbutz or uh, Israeli villages. Yes. Eh, ringrazio questo, eh, non so come si può dire, sito, eh, Ainakba, che mi ha aiutato moltissimo a trovare questi, eh, questi luoghi che sono comunque molto difficili da, eh, da scoprire e, e sì, tornando alla domanda di, di Sandy è stata un'esperienza molto, eh, molto forte, molto drammatica. So uh, he is grateful to Ainakpa, that is the site that helped him identifying these villages that are very difficult uh, to find, and, and he, he indeed confirms that has been a painful experience. And now, actually, we will move to a very strange moment with Nick, that Nick came to live with us for three months and the whole thing was a complete different uh, commission where he was immersed with us in this idea of understand the stone sector in Palestine, right? And in many ways it was really intense because we were in the middle of the private and the public sector and, and as if the Palestinian authority asked us to speak with people that they are stronger than them in many ways. And, and we found ourselves as in a very strange moment of understanding, you know, we were working with the most uh, difficult uh, uh, 
industrial sector in Palestine, they, they were digging under the ground, actually transporting the Palestinian stone everywhere in the rest of the world. So the only thing that you hear about really Palestine that everybody knows about is the Jerusalem stone. And we are transporting this everywhere. And we were just like, how can we understand this? No? And, and Nick was basically in the middle of all this. So I would like him to. Uh, um, that, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sandy. Um, so I. I I hope it's okay, um, but I've I've planned like a small theoretical um, provocation or speculation, which will weave in my experience at Dar as a resident and this project that that Sandy introduced. Um, but I, I more recently um, worked on the Refugee Heritage Project as an editor, um, so I I. I I spent quite a quite a lot of time not writing myself, but um, but working with the words and working with the stories. Um, and you know, one, one of the things that that Refugee Heritage deals with and and was spoken about um, is this critique to uh, some more contemporary activities of UNESCO to politicize heritage. And now I, I don't I don't know if Refugee Heritage itself is. Um, kind of, you know, took this from the very beginning to say, yes, we're going to politicize this as much as humanly possible or not. But I think, I think that that's really one of the, the, the successes um, that, that should be valorized about this project is that it has it radicalized the, the politicization of heritage. Um, now, what the way that it did this, um, and now I, I think the, the the UNESCO the UNESCO form itself is very much a vehicle of politicization. Heritage itself is a vehicle of politicization. But the way that 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 this act is achieved um, is by uh, recounting stories, producing models, taking photographs. It's effectively by creating an archive. Um, and so in this sense, it, it, we can maybe connect this project of refugee heritage to a wider discussion about the, the politics of an archive. Um, but there, there is, um, and you know, e each of these different you know, formats that, that, uh, you know, that I was saying, stories, models, photographs, interviews, et cetera, um, they, they all allow you to access the situation um, that, that it is uh, that is trying to describe. It's a question of representation. Um, and so, you know, as, as, uh, as, as Zaki said, um, with the photographs, which are incredibly powerful as photographs, but, you know, if they were to be seen within, within the framework of UNESCO, they might only be able to be read as deep as their aesthetic values, right? Um, but there, there's a question in cultural heritage, uh, sorry, in, yeah, in, in heritage that asks the, this, this very, it's a, it's a much more abstract term of cultural expressions that you said, and, and this, this is a very kind of unruly, um, you know, topic. It's, it's an unruly, uh, you know, concept. It, it can be represented in, you know, we, we get that a, a bit in stories, we get that a bit in photographs. We're, we're, there are kind of, um, you know, fragments all around. Um, but I, here I, I really want to, to, to pick up and kind of to echo and maybe amplify something um, Something, something that Jad said in the morning as, as a provocation of his. Um, but I think one of the most successful uh, and one of the most uh, rich forms of uh, representation that allow cultural expressions to be read is the plan, is the survey, is the map. Um, and so I, I, want to, I want to echo this, um, the, this, this call, this question, that what would a real cartography of Dehesha look like? Um, and then if, if we start thinking of um, you know, of other forms of documentation that, that, allow, uh, that, that allow cultural expressions and the heritage of a site to be read, um, there, there is a very um, sensitive political question of, uh, of abstraction and to what, to what scale or to what level of detail um, do, do, these, do these representations go to. Um, you know, there, there's a, one could speak of a plan as, as an anatomical drawing, which, uh, which also speaks about the, the, you know, the, the violence to the body that, that it's documenting. Um, but I, I, what, one of the things that I kind of personally was, was always um, you know, looking for in, in this project, but I, I think it's, uh, it's a very kind of powerful terrain to, to move forward, um, is in this, in, in, in a more uh, kind of abstract uh, or, or um, as a more, let's say, orthogonal form of documentation. Um, you know, 
it's it's not to put aside the violence that that entails, but it's to it's at least to to problematize and to question it. Um, and so th this is kind of where where uh, my experience at Dar comes in. Um, when I was a resident, uh, as 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 Sandy mentioned, um, we were we were asked to be the people who would bring together the government and Palestine's most powerful industry. Um, and the way we did this was by making maps. Um, we, we, we created a, a graphic and a visual narrative that allowed these two people who were radically at odds basically to just fight with each other. Um, but you know, by, by, by producing this graphic material, it allowed them to come into the same space um, and it allowed them to, to discuss, to debate, to understand kind of where, where the terms and, uh, and conditions of the other people were. Um, and so if, if, in, if in that case, maps um, and this planimetric level of abstraction allowed the public and private to come together, um, th this isn't a very mediatory role, but here I, I maybe want to, to uh, to, to go, or, or to, to, to bring in something that, um, that the work of AL and, and, and forensic architecture um, has experienced in the past, um, where now the, the way that they've deployed this is, is in very particular situations where, where it's a question of contestation, uh, where it's a question of did this happen or not. But I think, you know, in, in the way that uh, it, so, what, what I'm trying to say with invoking forensic architecture, um, particularly their, their project in Berlin, um, by documenting a site in a particular way, by creating a model, by creating plans, you do not just produce knowledge and produce evidence of a situation, but you, you set the terms of the debate. You, you effectively, uh, you know, you say to the people that you're speaking to, I am willing to speak in this degree of technicality and this language, and it, it forces a level of detail um, for, for the other party that, that you're working, uh, I don't want to say with, it's more like against in this case, um, to uh, to to use, and it's it's actually in these cases where where the arts and, and architecture where th this this is our expertise. We 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 learn representation. We think through representation. We see representation, um, and so I think you know what what this uh, what what this provocation uh, to 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 use cartography to map to survey um, as a, a form of uh, of of presenting cultural heritage, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's an additional, but it's a particularly powerful way to legitimize the claim that, that, um, that the very kind of troubled, uh, uncertain and unstable and potentially volatile claim that, that this project is making um, and that the work of DAR makes, that, that there is an undeniable existence and value. And it, you know, by, by creating a plan, it does not, um, it does not in, in, in the way that, uh, that I would, uh, at least I would, I would argue, you know, the way that Francesca might uh, talked about the, the, the labels, it does not, let's say, memorialize, it does not fix in place, but it does undeniably document a proof of existence. It does say this is here, and this is a way that we can read the complexities in the different folds of life. It provides a very ample medium for that. So um, I will leave my... I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, very much. We open the floor now, and uh, yeah. So. I, I just wanted to know uh, what kind of conflict exists between the yeah. Palestinian Authority and the stone industry. Because we, we see these locations everywhere in Palestine, wherever we travel in the West Bank, mm -hmm. but I, we never understand how does it work, in fact. I mean, how they take over land, they, they, they can, can they work anywhere they want, they communicate with the Palestinian Authority? So the, the, the land is, is uh, largely privately owned, um, which is actually, it's quite, a, it's quite a unique condition to Palestine. There's, there's very few countries in the world where land can be privately owned in this sense. Um, United States is one of the other few, uh, but most, uh, let's say mo most monarchical, monarchical uh, countries you can't. Um, and so land is, is bought. The, the, the people that are, um, that are in this industry are some of the most wealthy uh, people in the country, and they effectively just buy out farmers for enormous plots of land. And but e you know, even in private uh, land ownership situations, such as the United States dealing with resource extraction, there still are a set of rules. There are a set of protocols, but there are also a set of of um, 
of, of verification procedures, and and uh, I, I'm forgetting the, the specific terms, um, but there, there are ways to verify that the rules are being followed, and if not, there are ways to enforce them. In Palestine, there are neither of those two things. So while there are some very uh, there are some very provisional rules. There is absolutely no way to supervise that, and there is even less of a way to enforce their compliance. So, so was it that the Palestinian Authority wanted to, you know, establish some rules, or yeah, they did yeah. in that case. That's one thing that that would be positive. I mean, to what, hear about the, the, the way the way that we that we effectively approach the situation is not to say, hey, you guys are doing it this way, but really you should be doing it another way. Um, we we were we were trying to uh, we were trying to formalize um, what uh, what was happening. Try to to I don't know to try and shape it. Um, but we were we we I think we understood immediately. You can't just go to you cannot just go and say well you're you can't do this anymore. It's a it's a very problematic. Yeah, and, and I think that there was a moment where, you know, they were taking the stones, leaving everything as it is, and, and you know, some cases of kids that uh, lost their life, right, in, in that such, because they would create a very dangerous condition in the middle of the city, because in Hebron, for example, the whole area of Hebron, a whole holes remained, and of course, we, the, the way, strangely, paradoxically enough, why we were invited to do this, because they thought, wow, these guys are studying how they can transform the settlements into school or, uh, or university, so maybe they can understand how we can transform these holes that are left by all the industry into something else, right? So they brought us and said, what should we do now the day after, right? It's the same thing, is it come and help us to understand what to do with these holes, right? And and we arrived and we didn't understand that we were in the middle of all this, right? Because we thought that we are there to sort of understand. And then they brought us in the room with the most powerful men of Palestine, I mean, among them Nassar. I mean, Nassar is just to say it short. He managed to cross the borders without anything without being checked while Abu Mazen is checked. So we are at a point where we were really speaking about the most powerful sector, and then we had no entitled entitlement on them rather than the Palestinian authorities. But, but in that case, the Palestinian authorities thought that maps might be a way to shift the discussion, right? So it was a way to sort of say, let's try another language. Maybe this would be happening. And we caught in the, we were caught in the middle. And and in many ways, we we did a plan. And then the Palestinian Authority is trying to enforce it. I don't know what will be happening. But basically, it was much more. The whole commission is that let us speak with each other with your nice maps. No, it's, uh, maybe. So uh, to, to, to answer maybe in short, if, if you don't mind, um, so that there were there were two ambitions. One was to to say, you know, can we think of a mechanism that asks, you know, uh, these uh, quarry owners to reinvest in the site in the rehabilitation of that site? Let's say dedicate, you know, one percent of their profits or whatever the terms might be. Um, but the other was to kind of take the the existing situation and um, start to draw lines of expansion, start to draw lines of growth, to say like, okay. You, this this amount of space can be can be used for further extraction, but not beyond that, because that we need to preserve that uh, for for uh, environmental reservations or 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 wildlife, etc. Because they're also destroying the landscape. I mean, all the mountains in Palestine. What makes what makes it actually beautiful and cultivation and whatever it was. It's all destroyed by. I mean, some of it by expansion of Ramallah and all this high rise, and the other is by. Um, the, the stones of... The I, I guess, of the you know, you are completely right. I guess what happened is that the Palestinian Authority, looking at our website and all what we did, they thought that the private sector is colonizing Palestine similar to the way that Israelis are doing it, but they were unable to figure it out. So maybe they thought, maybe we need another process of decolonization <laughs> in different manner. And I mean, I don't, I don't know if they put it really all together, but certainly they thought that we might be uh, the ones that might be helping understanding how not to ruin 
and uh, I'm just surprised that the Palestine Authority wants that because they're also participating, giving all these permits to all these people without imposing any rules. And no, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure they are giving all these permits. In many ways, there is, it's a very informal sector. But also there is the Israeli aspect of it, is that how are these people getting um, all these permits to do explosive? You know, like to, I mean, that to me is very strange. Like when you said Nassar walks off without any check. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's also, it, it, there, there is another there, thing, another no layer. There's no use of explosives. Um, there, there are some Israeli operated mines in Area C, um, but actually the vast majority of the, of the mines are, are located in Area B. Um, so those uh, comply with the with the regulation to not use uh, explosives, and and we, we we went to these sites, we went to, you know to the mines, and, and it's it's this machine that has an arm and it goes very slowly, very oh, very see. slowly, um, but also the rock is kind of soft, so you can just cut it away. So it's only Area C that that has the Israeli and Israeli operated, yes. I, w I, I want to refer back to the private owners of this land. Uh, what's uh, what's in p for them in uh, benefit? What do they benefit? Is and uh, do they think of money? Uh, re money. Yeah. Money. So yeah. they're, they're re okay, but mm. are they planning malls there or uh, no. gentrifying? No, it's it's their just it's a way it's so a way for them to, to to build a house in the city and to start a new life. Um, and unfortunately, this is, this is not just uh, common to, to the Palestinian situation. This also happens in the United States. That's why there's so much fracking. That's why, that's why oil is so big, because if, if you're offered a check for you know, $200,000 and you're making, you know, you're, you're just getting by on, you know, to, to use a very American term, like food stamps and, and, and you know, welfare, it's a, you know, you're going to take that. You're, right. you're going to but the question here is that if these owners are uh, invited you to their meetings in order to find alternative ways of reclaiming no, the land. Only the police, but these other people were there, the owners were in Because the they, I mean, the Palestinian That's Authority was trying to find a way to regulate, <coughs> I mean, to, to sort of, uh, you know, regulate. make this a possibility. There was no common terrain, no, between the Palestinian Authority and this private industry, and they thought that we might be able to create that common terrain, or at least to bring them together in the room, because by bringing them together in the room, it was already something that, you know, they sort of operate. Uh, it's interesting that they came back to you on this, because yes. there is also, it's also the dust from this is a health hazard. Massively. Uh, and also yeah. environmental, as not to mention the disaster, environmental disaster. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's strange that the, there were no other activists working on this or uh, international organizations, uh, especially uh, you know, global or environmental organizations involved in this. And they came, they came back to you to architecture. I mean, just thinking of architecture as an alternative. Well, so uh, at least from the way that I understood the project, and I mean, the, I, I only came in to kind of execute it. I didn't receive the commission or anything, but um, there was a bit of an idea that like, we can't really touch the way things are. We can only touch the way things are going, right? So, so the, you know, dealing with environmental contamination was, was one of our chief concerns in determining, you know, how much more land this industry could take. Um, you know, how far away from its current mines could it expand? Um, but it, it was, it was a, it, it's a different operation, I believe, to, to intervene in the, the current processes. Don't you think it has a lot to do with uh, the divisions of area A, B, and C? Don't you think that it has difficulties of, of regulating this? It's because of the difference on who controls particularly B and C? Yeah, I mean, in, in that sense, absolutely, this was the major yeah. problem. And yeah. of course, we come back out of, I mean, of course, Israel is the major problem in that sense. But what the Palestinian Authority was hoping into achieving there, yeah. that even in the areas where we are not controlling fully, maybe we can find ways in order not to devastate the land mm -hmm. to such extent, mm -hmm. no? So to bring them to understand how this be a possible, uh, I, I don't know, they were trying to understand how can we still understand the future Palestine with these guys doing all what they are doing. And in, in, yeah, this was the whole 
uh, I believe, uh, but of course, it, it's the whole imposition of uh, area A, B, and C that make make you know, it in so Lebanon, hard. In, in Lebanon, it's exactly the same. It's even in certain areas worse. And there is no A, B, and C. We are, we are, Jad will tell you, but now you can go, I mean, Lebanon is a little chain of mountains along the sea. It's a minuscule country, and you have a devastation of, of, of mountains because it is attributed by political uh, clients, by, by political leaders to clients. And uh, can we have the mountain? No, exactly. And there is no, I mean, no regulation it's, uh, whatsoever to stop them from doing that because politically motivated. And maybe just to close, I know that there are a lot of very interesting things around stones, but it's only to close uh, <laughs> saying <laughs> that in many Decolonizing <laughs> stones. <laughs> Decolonizing stones. And it has been since we were, since we did this residency with Nick and, and many others that we thought that this would absolutely uh, still be having an art form where we can, uh, but, but we never, come there. So sometimes some projects are more into uh, that level. Other projects might take from the beginning an, an art form and then continue in other things. And some would not even end it up in uh, any any form of artistic uh, expression. So it's I'm, I'm happy that we brought all this because it feels that we are sort of uh, very much speaking about the practice in many angles. But it's the first industry. It's the most money-making industry in Palestine. It's stone uh, uh, trade. All Amman, all Amman villas are built of stone coming from Hebron. And also UAE mm -hmm. now brings from, I mean, yeah. it's been for the past two decades that from all these beautiful Hebron, villas they also call it the Hebron. Palestinian uh, stone. Stones can travel and people cannot. In fact, in fact, it's called what the white uh, white oil. Yes. This is our oil. Okay. I would like to ask a question to Zena, if possible. Yes. Uh, Zena, I remember originally, but I don't know if you were involved in that or you had time to look it up. Uh, uh, originally, the museum was called the Museum of Memory, Matha Zakira. Can you tell us how, how it moved from Matthav Zakira to what it is now, or is it uh, something that you didn't take part in that was earlier yeah. on? Um, I can tell you what I know. I've been on this committee for 10 years. Yeah. I, I was not, I, I'm, I'm, I, I've only been chair since May. Mm. But I know that this project has been in the making for over 20 years. Mm. And it has evolved in different ways. And then, in the end, I think probably around 10 years ago when I joined, um, there was a decision that we do, do not want to be reactive. We want to be proactive. Uh, we want to preserve the memory and, and preserve history and preserve heritage, but also we want to look at the future. We want to be involved, you know, we want to look at the future, we want to explore the future, we want to decolonize <laughs> the minds. Uh, so this is this is how the you know the the, the basic um, idea t changed, and it was about ten years ago when I when I joined. So there was a, a, and initially the the whole project. The, one of the reasons why it was delayed is because um, initially uh, they were hoping or dreaming, uh, dreaming, imagining that it would be in Jerusalem. But then I think there was a re realization that this would never be allowed and uh, but hopefully one day I mean there will be a branch in Jerusalem and we're actually looking at a property now but it will take time Rockefeller building which was the museum yeah. before 67 yeah is used by the Israelis as a museum uh, yes it is Still, it is it's a museum, museum. Or yes it's a Jerusalem museum. Uh, no no it is an Israeli, Israeli museum now yeah yeah I mean, full of, of Palestinian heritage, yeah. like all the other museums. But, but uh, totally you know, yeah, I mean, when I was uh, doing a bit of research about this paper, I looked at what they do in their, um, in their museums. And uh, I was telling some colleagues now that I did visit physically the, uh, the Holocaust Museum, the Yad Vashem. And it was like more of a fact-finding or a spying uh, mission. But, um, but their, their, their museums, their archives, um, they, they, you know, they, they even claim that they preserve our heritage. 
you know, the, 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 the library archive. They, they claim, oh, look at the Palestinians. They cannot even uh, preserve their heritage. We're doing it on their behalf. <laughs> so they have digitized, like, you know, huge, huge amounts of, of newspapers, of documents, of what have you. But of course, in the middle of everything, they have um, interjections like people writing, coming in here, coming in there. And, and like they do normally, you know, there's always, always an Arab uh, sort of contributor, a Palestinian contributor to, to whitewash the, the, the story, unfortunately. I think uh, the very first meeting for the museum was in 96 or 97. There you are. And um, I presented a paper then, and uh, that's when someone from the PLA who suggested the title of Remembrance. And there was an objection to it because it's very similar to the Israeli yeah. museum uh, title. It's the Remembering, mm. the, the Holocaust fashion, yeah. Remembering. And uh, Mahmoud Darwish was there then. Okay, and he said, we really need to think about this. But he, he was for a, a title in the beginning. But it was used for almost 10 years as a working title because there wasn't a consensus right. on using the, that same museum. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they had any ambition in uh, moving on to the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem. It's, it's always been called Rockefeller Museum, by the way. It was never called the Jerusalem Museum. Right. And, uh, uh, but Tell what, please, it. we are not. Oh, oh sorry. Speak to the microphone. <laughs> it's either <laughs> worse or doesn't work at all. Sorry. So that's, uh, and for I, I understood it was a working title, the Memory Museum at Dakira, because there wasn't a consensus on using it at that time. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Salwa, for clarifying. Yeah, Ibrahim, uh, Professor Ibrahim, Abulugat. Ibrahim Abulugat was yes. leading the project at that time. Yes. Um, again, thank you all for your great work, really, and inspiring um, initiatives. One of the things that I, um, always think about regarding to Palestine is that there are all these amazing work, inspiring people come and do incredible work and then they go. And um, so, so I, I was just thinking about, for example, the museum, the Palestine Museum, but we don't have museum study program or we don't have you know, a film study department or a film school. But also in terms of architecture, um, you know, your work is really amazing, but then if you leave what happens to that legacy or to, to, to that also, um, you know, that, that important sort of, that needs to be continued. Like, have you thought about it, like now that you, in Sweden? Um, so the question is for Zena and, um, um, and for Sandy also is that, you know, so, I mean, there's just so much to be done and so much to be continued, and how do we have institution that will carry this over? Because, again, you know, the question of Palestine is, you know, obviously we're not gonna be liberated anytime soon, so how do we carry this work for, for the future in terms of what you guys are doing and trying to create? And it's not just the individual, it's the, it's, you know, it's involving more people and having the institution to, to institutions yeah. to actually do the kind of work that you started and initiated. Okay, uh, thank you, Sana. I la we're, I am working, or my team is working on two tracks. One is uh, is the exhibitions, running the exhibitions and keeping the program going. Which, uh, and 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 the other track is the institutionalization, institutionalizing the, you know, the the museum because. Um, as, as you know, this is a very young project, um, a small team. I think the average age is, is 35 or possibly less. <laughs> yeah, um, most of them are women, very, very motivated. Uh, but we are working on institu institutionalizing the, uh, the, the, the in, in terms of, of governance, in terms of capacity building, in terms of, of building the right team uh, in terms of strategy for the future. So we are, in terms also, we, we're looking at the fundraising because so far this, is most, this has been mostly uh, funded by, by individuals, private, you know, ta'awun uh, members. Uh, we are looking at, at a, a waqfiyeh, help me some, 
a trust fund or a, yeah, yeah, trust fund, endowment, yeah. We're looking at an endowment. So we, we, yeah, yeah, we are looking, my mandate now is for three years. And we've put all these KPIs and we're going through them one by one. And, and one of them is definitely solid fundraising uh, plan, uh, team, fundraising team, the endowment. Uh, the other thing is capacity building. Um, yes, we don't have a museum, uh, a, a museum training uh, or, or university degree in, in Palestine, but apparently now this is not the, you know, apparently this is not, this is not the thing we need. You know, you need uh, to, to send people on, uh, to shadow on internships abroad. So we, we, we are trying hard and we are learning. And this is why we have curators from coming from abroad or curators coming from the Guggenheim or, or we have Rachel doing this. Basically, we are trying to, uh, to, to teach our team. And, and there has been a marked difference since the first exhibition, Jerusalem Lives. We've had like uh, someone coming to manage from France, a woman coming to, and, some, and many members of the team came from uh, outside of Palestine. This uh, exhibition that we will be uh, launching in, in uh, March, um, most of the work is being done by, by, by the team. And like I've said, very young people, and they have learned from their first uh, experience. And I am very confident that, that we will deliver. You know, I mean, we, we're only two or three weeks away, and I, I am very confident that we will deliver a, a high-quality exhibition. Not only that, but also an educational and a public program. A, a good educational and public program. We've, we're thrilled, like, for our first uh, exhibition, uh, we had 15,000 visitors, and this was over uh, uh, five months. This was, like, beyond, beyond anything we've, we'd ever thought we would, you know, capture. 15,000 people visited our first exhibition, uh, Jerusalem Lives. Yeah, maybe only uh, to answer uh, your question about what we do with, you know, what we did in the last uh, 15 years. And I have to say that this move was out of um, maybe two major motivations. One is that we felt trapped and comfortable. So I would explain why trapped and why comfortable. In, in many ways, you know, we arrived to a point where commissions were coming to our table in the house and we felt in the last two years that we were a bit repeating ourselves in a sense and we felt very worried about us being trapped within, uh, you know, at the end you are asked to do what you are good at and we feel that we don't want to do other 10 years similar to the last 10 years. So from a personal level, we feel we need absolutely to shake the ground below us and we cannot feel that comfortable, really. We are, it's very, it, it feels so strange to arrive to say, I feel comfortable under colonialism, but we felt comfortable within our own practice, right? And we needed a bit of a shake of who we are and, uh, and then the other, re I mean, other motivation we felt is that, uh, you know, with the whole I, uh, uh, refugee, what, what is called refugee crisis, right, in Europe, we felt for the first time, speaking about decolonization, that the struggle of decolonization is finally in Europe, right? And it's not anymore only in the colonies, but it is for maybe the first time in Europe, and we wanted to engage with this. We really feel that this is maybe the place where sh we should be, and maybe where we can still be taking Palestine somewhere else, because we all the time say, how can we you know, contribute from Palestine to somewhere else? So majorly what we wanted to engage with this struggle of decolonization that is now taking place in, uh, in Europe. And then, you know, I can tell you a lot of things would be what I've feel we did in Palestine is that we throw some uh, hubub, some uh, seeds, 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 right? And nobody knows if some of them would become trees, others would stay on the level of being seeds. And, you know, it, and we cannot claim absolutely, uh, okay, I, I mean, when it, we cannot claim legacy on that 
small seeds. I mean, they gr they should grow up in the way they should grow up. But I can tell you, I think that in many ways, students of architecture in Birzeit is very much influenced. The Palestinian Authority and the whole planning department is influenced. And to say they are only influenced by us, I cannot tell you. I mean, we certainly had some legacy in, in Palestine, but n from now on, I cannot claim legacy on a plan that is growing as, as an alone tree under a sun and this. So I don't think it's right neither to hold us responsible, neither to claim any right on these plants that are growing alone. And matter of fact, we feel that maybe we were a, a, a tree now and we need to be seeds somewhere else. So this is what, why we are in Sweden right now. You know, you should be called not impermanent, but impertinent, because, <laughs> because you, you, you dare, you know, you are bold. Because what you just said is, is, uh, is bold, it's bold. In other words, I mean, you, you need guts to, to remember that you plant seeds, but you let other people also grow with it. But uh, this impertinence is what I call your modernity, really, uh, in this capacity because it's so much more comfortable to, to keep the routine than to, 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 to throw new ideas. But I, I entirely agree with you that uh, the new reality of the, of the migration is, in, is, a, is a colonial uh, uh, new setup which is inverted, where, where it's no more the colonials who go to the colonies. It's the colonized who are going to the colonizers, but in the same sort of relationship, particularly those who cross from Africa and North Africa to, towards Europe. Well, I have to commend you on this as well because I think your project Campus in Camps, when you look at it, is not called Sandy and Alexandra's project. <laughs> it's called Campus in Camps. And I think this testifies to what you just said, that you left the seed and the seed has an, its own integrity and grew on its own. Because there is a tradition, seems like a tradition, and when you go to the West Bank, you hear, oh, this is, Abu Kaza project, Abu Ammar's project, Abu Jihad project, I don't know whose project. So it's not a, a community or a collective project. And what I really admire about their work, the, the work of Sandy and Zandro, is the fact that they, they don't work alone. And it's not like we observed what happened, we were inspired by this drama or this war, and this is the product, and then gets into the art market. This is a totally different and unique approach, I think. Uh, very few artists have uh, attempted an approach where there is collectivity in this. So they're taking a plunge. I mean, you're taking a risk, practically, working with so many diverse people from so many different backgrounds. And yet they all came, came along this one idea. And uh, you coming here to our university, I think you have started something to us for us because my students now I have this forum and they're very much engaged in what is the difference between engaging visitors at museums and having a dialogue with them. There's a difference between both. So just for them to appreciate this through your Madafi and, and when you discuss participation was for me is a great opportunity for us. Thank you.